All right, more now in this year's race for governor. Voters from both major parties will head to the polls in June to vote in this year's primary. And whoever wins in June will be their party's nominee in this year's race for governor. Republicans will have four choices on the ballot. Congressman Lee Zeldin, the party's favorite, Andrew Giuliani, son of former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani, former Westchester County Executive Rob Astorino, and businessman Harry Wilson. Now, Wilson is an outlier here. He's the most removed from politics out of the bunch, but he's popular in the Republican Party. He ran for state controller in 2010 and came closer to winning statewide than any other Republican has in two decades. And he's now out with a new crime plan. We sat down to go through that plan and hear more about how he got here. Harry, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. It's great to be here with you. Thank you. So you are new to our audience. I want to give you the chance to kind of introduce yourself. People might have seen you on TV from your ads that are out, but mm -hmm. uh, tell people who you are and why you're running for governor. Sure. So I grew up not far from here in Johnstown, New York, uh, halfway between Albany and Utica. My dad's parents and my mom all moved there from Greece. Wilson is a pure Ellis Island creation. I'm a first generation Greek American. Very cool. uh, we only spoke Greek at home when I was growing up, and so I didn't learn English until nursery school. Uh, I was a working class family. My dad was a bartender at my uncle's restaurant in town, and my mom operated a sewing machine in a local factory. I was the first in my family to go to college. I was fortunate to, get, to go to Harvard and Harvard Business School. And then I went into business and I spent my career fixing failing companies, coming into situations where companies were in or near bankruptcy, where management had failed the people in the company and made terrible mistakes, and we came in to fix them. Uh, we've saved, over the course of nearly 30 years of doing that, hundreds of thousands of American jobs, mm. uh, and really made a big difference for those companies. And that's exactly the skill set I think we need in governor. I think we have the most failed institution in America in New York state government, and I think that turnaround skill set that we need to fix the state is what will benefit all 20 million New Yorkers if we can, uh, if I can get elected in, in November. It's a unique perspective because none of the other candidates that are running have that kind of trajectory in terms of career. Everybody else has either, you know, been in politics or, or not really been in a, a specific industry like that. It's an interesting perspective. But I do want to talk to you. I want to start with your crime plan that is mm -hmm. new out in May. Um, it, it's a it's comprehensive, uh, more than other candidates have put out for sure. And it has four steps that are broken down into smaller steps. So the first one that I want to start with is cashless bail because mm -hmm. that's obviously the hot topic of the election. I think crime is on the the minds of voters. We see it in the polls. So. Your plan, you want to end cashless bail, which isn't necessarily uh, unique among Republicans. Uh, you want judges to be able to determine what's called dangerousness, mm -hmm. uh, somebody's perceived threat to public safety. I want to ask you from your perspective, because some people will say dangerousness may be a slippery slope for some, some people. So in your plan, in your mind, how would you define when somebody is dangerous and when somebody is not? Sure. So I think it's, it's really important to think about uh, kind of how we've gotten to this place. We have much higher crime rates than we did just a few years ago. Yeah. And I believe an important contributor to that has been the so-called bail reform laws that were passed. And you know the, the beautiful thing about democracy is we have 49 other states to compare New York's results to. And so what we know in those 49 other states uh, virtually all of them have judicial discretion around bail. Right. And we also know that every single other state and the federal government all allow for a dangerousness standard. And the reason for that, I think, is common sense, which is what are the reasons to keep someone who has been accused of, of a crime off the streets? There are generally two big ones. One is flight risk, um, and obviously, obviously the fact that they may flee justice, uh, but then also dangerousness. And that's why 49 other states and the federal government allow for that. So I don't, I don't think it should be as controversial as it's become. I think there's ideology that kind of you know, clouds the, the common sense reality of the situation. Um, and I would leave it not to myself or a politician, but to the judges who have been you know, selected to, to be in that position. So you don't think there should be like a specific rubric of questions that they should ask? It should really be at the discretion of just the judges who can decide based on each case individually. Yeah, I think in general there is a excessive tendency by people in Albany to try to legislate everything. Yeah. And I believe what we should do is set clear rules of the road, broad principles, and allow people to, to operate within those principles. And then to the extent there are problems, we should address those. Um, and so I think that ends up being a far more um, effective way of running any organization is what I've done in my business career, but it's also far more fulfilling for the people in it. Um, and what ends up happening is people you know, develop good judgments and decisions and to the extent there are issues and you can reform those through training and, and, and uh, ways to address those. Now, how do you balance that with uh, the idea behind bail reform was to get rid of the system where you have some people who can pay to get out on bail, others are not, and then they're incarcerated pre-trial. How do you balance your idea to end a cashless bail and have dangerousness with that idea of making the system more equitable, more fair? 
Sure. So when the, uh, when people raise the socioeconomic questions, one, I'm very sensitive to socioeconomic issues. I grew up in a working class family. We didn't have any money growing up. Right. And so I recognize that there are folks who are obviously in different, you know, kind of different means. But the, the standards shouldn't be about socioeconomic status. It should be about dangerousness. So if someone, whether they're poor or wealthy, if they're a threat to society while they're awaiting trial, that's where the judge's discretion should come in. Uh, and so that, that's why I kind of rely on that as opposed to whether someone's, you know, kind of where they are in the socioeconomic spectrum. And if you compare that with a speedy trial, which all Americans are entitled to, accused of a crime are entitled to, then I think you can address the problems that have happened in the past without throwing out the, the broader system. And the core problem was that we had some high profile situations which were tragic and that had actually very little to do with, with bail, much more about a lack of a speedy trial. Mm. Uh, and what's actually happened, even though there have been some reforms around on that, it's created an undue burden on prosecutors and defense attorneys. So now you hear from both sides that they're complaining about the discovery uh, changes, for example, that have made um, the access to a speedy trial more complicated, not less. So we've actually compounded the problem because we had politicians talking about sound bites as opposed to really trying to solve the problem. So what do you do about that speedy trial problem? Is it just about more funding for courts? Uh, making uh, one idea has been to create more judgeships. Uh, of course, that comes with infrastructure as well. Do you have any ideas on how to to make sure that everybody has a speedy trial so nobody is languishing in these jails. Sure, so I think there are a couple important issues. One is um, because of the changes in the discovery uh, uh, rules, that's made it harder to get to a speedy trial. And so if we have, for example, materiality or reasonable standard, which is true in any kind of walk of life, right. whether it's a business deal or something, you say to yourself, is this a material? If it's not, then why spend time on it? And that's what in, what's happened um, with the change in the discovery statute, that's gone away. So that's made things more cumbersome. So I think fixing that so that we focus on that materiality reasonable standard would help. And the second part is staffing appropriately. Part of the reason we're running into problems on trials is because crime is up. Mm. <laughs> so you just have more people in the system. And so, you know, I think if we can kind of focus on the, you know, the 14 page plan that we have that kind of really, I believe will reduce crime and recidivism and repeat offenders particularly, which are, I think are a core part of the problem, then we'll have fewer cases in the system. And if, but if it turns out that that's not fast enough, then you have to look at expanding the system to make sure that people get to a speedy trial. So you're against the defund the police movement. We're talking about funding, obviously. Uh, how, do you, how do you balance the defund the police movement with the need to have officers who are not treating people of color in a disproportionate way? Mm -hmm. Obviously, I think everybody wants to be treated equally. We want to respect members of law law enforcement, but how do you make sure that you have both of those things? Yeah, so I think, you know, the it's important to look at the facts in New York State specifically. There are some horrible situations that have happened around the country. Yeah. There's been very little in New York State over the last decade. And that's a testament to the law enforcement leadership around the state who, you know, dealt with some problems that existed before that period of time and f invested in training and, and, and really kind of trying to make sure that did not happen. And so I think we've made great strides in New York in dealing with those issues and that's why I think we lead other states, which I think is a terrific testament to those law enforcement leaders on, on, uh, across the state. Um, and you have to keep investing in training. Um, what's actually happened in certain um, uh, agencies around the state is there's been a reduction in training because of budget cuts and because it hasn't kept pace with inflation. And so that's more likely to lead to a problem as opposed to doing what's actually been working for the past decade and in investing in training. So that's one piece of it. Second piece of it, because of the hit to morale that's happened to police officers across the state, retirements and departures have accelerated dramatically and recruiting has gotten harder. So as a result, staffing has come down in, in most um, parts of the state, I think almost all parts of the state. And so that makes people, particularly in people in, in communities that are more, uh, have more crime, more at risk. Um, so I believe that there is a, you know, that, again, this kind of comes down to politics versus problem solving. I'm a problem solver, not a politician. And I think that politicians tend to kind of take one side of the debate. The answer is we've actually done a really good job in the state. Can we do better? Of course we can. And we should try to do better. But we should focus on how do we do better as opposed to just demonizing the other side and not trying to solve the fundamental problem. Part of your plan talks about breaking down these silos that we often have between uh, you know, members of law enforcement and mental health services and addiction services too. Uh, tell me what that would look like under your administration. How would you how would you make everybody work a little bit better together so we don't have these situations where people with a mental health issue aren't getting the help that they need? Yeah, absolutely. So um, let me and give you an anecdote and I'll come back to the specific solution. So the sure. anecdote is what, I, what we interview, we interview tons of people across the state to build our crime plan, people on the front lines, law enforcement, prosecutors, defense attorneys. And well, one thing we heard very frequently is that 
uh, from a number of sheriffs was that their law enforcement, uh, their, the members of their team were forced to deal with mental health issues that they felt they, felt they weren't equipped to, to deal with. Mm -hmm. And it was a lose-lose. It was bad for the, uh, for the person in question. It was bad for the police officer. Um, and, and so to me, the way to deal with that is start at the top and create a, a little SWAT team that basically breaks down silos and kind of goes after looking at it systemically statewide. Where are the where are the uh, the handoffs, the drops, and handoffs uh, in coverage? Um, the biggest are crime to mental health to homelessness, and there's obviously a nexus for some portion of people across those. But there are a lot of people who are only one of those buckets, obviously. And so the question is, how, for people who who um, kind of spill across those various buckets. How do we make sure they're getting the services they need uh, at, a, at a state level and then kind of bringing it down to, to local, local um, uh, agencies? Sure. Uh, we want, you know, I think in general, I'm for bringing services as close to people as possible, so investing in local support, not at the state level, but we can have a statewide perspective that then brings in to drive those changes kind of locally. Uh, so that's where we'd start. I think at the end of the day, it'll end up being um, you know, creating enough of an infrastructure around mental health needs and homeless needs uh, that we kind of kind of augment the police as opposed to, you know, expect them to do something that they haven't necessarily been trained to do or is not really kind of in their, in their best wheelhouse. Uh, and I think that will be a, end up being a win-win both for the, for the people um, who need the services as well as people trying to help them. Now that ties into this conversation. Uh, the last question for you about Rikers Island. So an interesting part of your plan is you don't want to have these community jails in New York City. You say Rikers Island can be improved by investing in it, improving the infrastructure, putting more funding in. Tell me what that would look like. A lot of people, you know, Rikers Island is, is not good. I mean, it, there's no other side to that. It's yes. just a bad place to be for everybody involved, Absolutely. for the correction officers, for the incarcerated people. So what would that look like? Yeah, so it's important to understand why did Rikers get it as bad as it is? Well, because the de Blasio administration basically neglected it for eight years. They didn't invest in any improvements, and, and over eight years, that compounds. And so now you have, a, you have a, as you said, a total lose-lose. It's bad for everybody involved. Um, now, in order, rather than admitting to the mistake and trying to rectify the mistake, which they should have done years ago, what the solution from the de Blasio administration was is create these community jails that no one wants and don't really solve the problem. And to give you an example of how misguided it is, right now there are between 5,000 and 5,500 inmates in Rikers today. The community jails have a capacity of about 3,000. Right. Well, what are we going to do with the 2,000 to 2,500 inmates who, who would not have a home uh, in that. Uh, and then when you think about the actual construction, there's like no outdoor space and there's no, there's nothing that would allow for the facilities and the resources that could be done in Rikers if it was properly invested. In. So I believe it would actually be cheaper and better to invest in Rikers. Um, and, and by the way, the, these community jails couldn't be done for another five years or more in right. the best case scenario. So we're gonna have to invest in Rikers anyways. And the fact that we're not thinking about it more holistically and trying to address it in that way uh, is just, a, I think, people unwilling to admit their mistakes in the past. All right, very interesting plan, very comprehensive. Harry Wilson, Republican candidate for governor, thank you. Great to see you, Dan, thank you.